Morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Brian Reynolds. I'm the chancellor with the Archdiocese. <coughs> Archbishop Joseph Kurtz has served as the Archbishop of Louisville since 2007. And as you are aware, on November 12th, he was elected president of the United States Con Conference of Catholic Bishops. And we're aware that so many national stories were done and, and feeds you got from around the country, but we did believe there was a good opportunity for the local uh, media to have an opportunity for a few minutes with him. Uh, he's on his way to Mexico today, so we're going to just have a little short while here with you. So Archbishop will have an opening statement followed by some time for some questions. So Archbishop Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Good morning, everybody. And just, uh, Brian, because you mentioned Mexico, buenos dias. <laughs> nice to be with all of you today. Uh, thanks for this chance to speak with you. Uh, I thought that what I would do is actually, uh, I hope not bore you, but actually read the statement that I worked on. And I, I hate not to use a statement that I've worked on. Um, so let me begin with that and then open it to any questions you might have. Um, I'm deeply honored that the body of bishops has elected me to serve as president of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. As our Holy Father, Pope Francis, calls us to witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ, I look forward to serving my brother bishops as together we seek to serve our Lord. The conference has a vital role in assisting each bishop in his ministry as well as proclaiming the church's teaching and perspective on important issues of the day. I ask the prayers of all Catholics as the Bishop's Conference strives to be the voice of those who are poor and vulnerable for re religious liberty, for the common good, and most importantly, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Cardinal Dolan has served as president with grace, courage, and humor. With deep gratitude, I thank him for his inspiring and dedicated leadership over these past three years. I've greatly enjoyed serving with him as vice president. I look forward to working with Cardinal DiNardo, the new vice president, as well as Archbishop Peter Sarton uh, of Seattle and Bishop Kevin Farrell of Dallas, who serve as secretary and treasurer, respectively. And I offer really special thanks to Monsignor Jenkins and the staff of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops through the intercession of our Blessed Virgin Mary, whose wholehearted yes is the inspiration for all of our efforts. May we cooperate with God's grace, sustain our church, and encourage all people of goodwill. Now, with that in mind, uh, perhaps one or two of you may have a question. Yes, Glenn. Thanks, Glenn, for covering here. Uh, I'm familiar with the record. <laughs> Is there any way to determine at this point how often your new responsibilities will take you away from Louisville? How much time you spend here? Is it a 50-50? Well, a good, good question. Uh, do I have to repeat the question, or do you all hear it? Did you hear it? Okay, uh, Glenn, good question about the, the proper balance, huh? Uh, let me begin by saying thank God for the internet because uh, already today I was able to remain very active and present here in the Archdiocese of Louisville and in the city of Louisville and already give an hour to the work of the conference. So uh, that's good news because uh, through social contact and social media I'm able to do much of the work right at my desk. Now there will be certain issues. Uh, obviously, uh, Brian Reynolds mentioned that I, I leave for uh, meetings in Mexico City that will involve the new evangelization. It's a, it's a major gathering. It's a pilgrimage as well as an encuentro or meeting uh, that will be in at the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico beginning tomorrow morning and going all the way till Tuesday. And on Tuesday, I have the privilege of offering uh, a 20-minute talk as part of a panel to represent the progress of the new evangelization within the Catholic Church throughout the United States. There'll be someone else talking about Canada and uh, someone from Brazil, uh, someone in representing uh, much of the rest of Latin America, and I'll bet there'll be somebody from Mexico. So uh, we'll have uh, a number of opportunities. and how rich it will be for me to be able to interact with people from both uh, South America, uh, Central America, and, and all of the North American continent. So I don't know, to answer your question, uh, 
probably the, the split will be somewhere like 75% remaining within the archdiocese and 25% on the road. Um, that's not a bad average, is it? No. Good. <laughs> Very good. Yes, sir. Just to follow up on Glenn's question, what I read in and where, where are you from? Hall with the Courier. Oh, Greg. Hey, good to see you. What I read in the record last night. Um, does this mean you'll do maybe fewer confirmations or? or Greg, thanks for it's a great question to ask. Uh, let me tell you this: that I will never publicly admit to being a workaholic. I, can, I really resist it because I don't think I am one. Who wants to be called a workaholic? Uh, but I do have a steady pace, and my hope will be to continue that steady pace. Now, thank God for a vicar general like Father Mark Spaulding, who's in the back of the room, uh, for uh, Dr. Brian Reynolds, who does so much on a day-to-day -day basis of administration within the archdiocese, uh, that we'll be sharing some things. But I'm not beginning by assuming that there would be a change. I think what's going to happen is I'll keep the exact same schedule. It's just if, if I get called away, we'll try to come up with a, um, an alternate, wa alternate way of doing things. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good plan. Are you from the cathedral? I thought so, yeah. Yes, sir. Archbishop Kurtz, it's good to see you. I'm Scott Atkins with Way 3 News. Hi, Scott. And I just wanted to find out what your reaction is to those who oppose this new role and those who may criticize some of the moves that you may or may not have done in, in recent years, particularly not uh, listing the names of convicted clerics, a move that more than 30 U.S. bishops have done previously. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the question. Uh, there will always be people who will... will challenge and, and, and make sure that, that uh, I try to do the best I can as the Archbishop here in Louisville and as the President of the Conference. Thank God for that. Because as our Holy Father said, if you remember, um, we all are imperfect. We all are sinners and we need the help of others. Uh, I will say this uh, with, with regard to the specific uh, issue of, uh, of sexual abuse and the Church's response. Um, we've made great progress. Now, is there a lot more to be done? Absolutely. Uh, the key is, of course, uh, being able to, to speak and act and advocate uh, for uh, the voiceless and the vulnerable. And uh, uh, victims, victim survivors of sexual abuse are certainly right there. Uh, how have we done it? Well, we've used the charter. And you know the charter uh, that was done in Dallas at the bishop's meeting, that would have been June of 2002, has become a bit of a blueprint for the steps we're taking. What are those steps? Well, the steps are zero tolerance, so that uh, there's no one in active ministry here within the Archdiocese of Louisville or any place else I've served uh, that ha has a credible allegation against him. And this includes uh, priests, deacons, and lay faithful who work uh, within the church. Uh, that's a very strong statement and, and has taken some energy to do, but we've remained resolved. And in fact, at the bishop's meeting just this past week, uh, we, we've had a chance to review some of uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, revisions of the charter. No substantial change, just that every five years we take another look at it to make sure that it continues to be there. The second issue, transparency. Uh, we immediately work with public authorities. Now, it's very, very important for us to cooperate with public authorities who, who know very well uh, that, that the priority needs to be given to the victim, but in addition to that, uh, we have to always be careful that there may occasionally be a false accusation. And we rely very much on public authorities. Thank God here in Louisville we have a very good relationship with public authorities. So I do stand by uh, my record. I, I do hope that uh, we will continue to not only uh, get better at, at developing safe environment, but maybe even be examples to other parts of our society that also need that. Thanks for asking that, that question, Scott. Yeah, Claudia. Now, when I spoke to you last week, you said I'd have to wait to ask this question. What? And uh, for lack of a more eloquent phrase, this is kind of a big deal. And, <laughs> and uh, I said, well, when it happens and you are elected president, will there be a moment where you take time to absorb um, 
the pressure, the enormity of the role? Has that, tell me kind of what was striking you what goes Wow, what, a, what a good question. Thanks for that, Claudia. Well, let me, let me respond by saying uh, thank God for airports and airplanes because it gives you a chance to reflect. Now, uh, you may know this, I think when we met last week, I guess it was, I mentioned this, that I've had the, the grace and blessing each month to make a, a, a visit for a full day to Gethsemane, to the Abbey of Gethsemane. And guess what? I'll be going the day after Thanksgiving. So I'll have all, all of Friday and all of Saturday as a wonderful opportunity prayerfully to reflect uh, joining in prayer with the community, but also having that, that time to be with the Lord and also to be um, out in nature there. So pray for good weather. Uh, th that's going to be important for me, and I plan to continue that. Don't we all need that opportunity for that break? Um, I I've had a tradition that I guess came from my seminary time that every morning I have a time of prayer. I call it a holy hour, even though sometimes that holy hour is only 20 minutes. But it's a, it, is an it is a time, and I think it's a very important time to do that. Um, two things keep coming to my mind, to be r very honest with you, and keeps... I feel fairly calm and serene. I hope uh, I continue that. Uh, one is that this is an act of service. I think I had mentioned uh, to you when we met that, that this election of the president and other officers is not a political process. There's not winners or losers. It's an act of presenting ourselves in service to Christ and his people. And so as long as I keep that in mind of serving, uh, that's going to be an easy thing to do. We all serve using the gifts God's given us. We're not the same people. I'm not, certainly not the same person as Cardinal Dolan. And by the way, he and I will be getting together in Mexico. He's also going to be down there. So that's one of the things I also do is pick the brains of previous presidents. I'll be meeting with Cardinal George uh, Thursday. I'm, I'm up in Chicago for uh, a meeting of Catholic Extension Society. So I'll be meeting with him also. Um, the second thing besides service is unity. We, we do need to do things together. And so the Bishop's Conference is specifically seeking ways that together, as a body of bishops, we can work, obviously, in union with our Holy Father, Pope Francis. So that's a, that's a long answer to a short question, but thank you. Yeah. Yes? Uh, and Rick, tell me. I'm sorry, Rick Howell from WFPL Radio. Hi, Rick. Uh, are any plans to meet with Pope Francis as part of your, your duties? Well, uh, first, thanks for asking that question, too, because I sure hope so. Uh, Pope Francis, I'm a fan of Pope Francis. You probably already knew that. And uh, we had a great meeting. I, can't, I don't know if it was a half an hour or 45 minutes. I'm not sure. Um, uh, I think, actually, I talk about it on my TV program, Conversations. You don't mind my giving a plug for that, do you? Okay. Um, the next time I will meet with him might well be all the way next October. Now, I hope it'll be sooner than that, but uh, we have a synod. And uh, one of the things that seems clear is the president of each Episcopal conference from throughout the world will be participating in that two-week synod. And that's a story of itself. We should have a, a, another news conference just to talk about that. Um, the, our Holy Father really wants to accompany people. And he really wants to have us be a voice that, that does that. And so uh, he'll give leadership, uh, even if I don't physically sit down with him, I read every homily he gives every morning. So I'm, I'm connected with him very much. Thanks for asking that, though. Yes, sir. Uh, Dylan Lovin from, a <coughs> excuse me, from AP. Um, Hi, Dylan. Kind of along those same lines, uh, what kind of work do the bishops have ahead of them to... Uh, uh, honor what the Pope has said um, about mercy over uh, uh, divisive social issues. Sure, sure. Well, uh, a number of things that are they're very evident. First of all, remember that uh, one of the first purposes of the Bishops' Conference is to assist individual bishops in their diocese. So we're working on the new evangelization and you've heard that term a lot of, and we're working on best practices and sharing those best practices among each other. There's a, a new website that will come up called the New Evangelization Toolkit, uh, NET. And I'll, in fact, I'll be, I know a little bit about it because I'll be talking about it in Mexico. That's part of my talk for next Tuesday. So that's one way is by, because really the pastoral presence that our Holy Father's talking about 
is going to happen uh, where the rubber reach the meets the road. It's gonna be in parishes, it's gonna be in hospitals, in schools, et cetera. And, and so that's best done by helping, first of all, our bishops uh, to be pastoral and to continue to be pastoral, which is very, very good. Remember, our Holy Father always says that mercy comes through the church. So we see the life-giving presence of our church teaching as not being something opposed to mercy. It is actually uh, an avenue of mercy and fullness of life. Uh, the second thing will obviously be the way in which we address and advocate issues of public policy. You know this, but it's, it's being challenged. Faith enriches public life. Now that's being challenged, but I still firmly believe that, that uh, I want to, to live my faith not imposing it on others, not being preachy, but being creative. That's what our Holy Father calls for. And I want to do it because the common good needs it. We, faith in our history has enriched public life. You look at the history of humanity, and you find that most efforts of serving others, of bringing out the dignity of people, flowed through religion uh, and our faith. Um, look at the history of our nation. And boy, are we proud that here uh, in Louisville, we're part of, you know, over 200 years. We're in our third decade as a diocese. There's not too many places in the United States can brag about that. Brag in a nice way, in a humble way. Um, but but as, as we do so, I think we, we do need to be aware of that, that, that our teachings are not uh, meant to, to, in some ways, limit, but rather to expand the, the capacity of us to treat people with dignity. And I think our track record's pretty good in being able to do that. If you look at the foundations of schools and hospitals and universities and uh, orphanages, just so many social service entities that, that even people who are not religious, and certainly people who are not Catholic, would say, boy, I benefited from that. So that's going to be our, our effort. It's a two-fold direction, isn't it? And I, I thank you for asking me that. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, Hola. <laughs> Will you also be a voice for the Latino community? Well, I sure hope so. I better get better in my Spanish, huh? I think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially well, on matters of immigration. Yeah, immigration reform. You know, we're, we're uh, I'm a little saddened that there's not more movement right now on a national level, and we've made that point uh, at, with every level of administration. Uh, we have the, 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 not only the Catholic bishops, but our Catholic Church ha has the moral principles that are the recipe for just immigration law. And uh, most people are coming to admit that the uh, policies are, are frayed, they're, they're, they're broken. And we need to have just immigration laws. Um, we have a recipe for that, and we also have people working hand-in-hand in, hand in advocacy uh, on the Hill today dealing uh, with it. Now, we need everybody else to work together on that, and we're going to do so in a way that's consistent, obviously, with our beliefs. You, you, would, you would, I think, appreciate that. And, uh, but yes, I, I agree with you. And, and it's many people, you probably know this, but our Catholic Charities here in, in Louisville is one of the largest helpers of, uh, of families who are immigrants and in, in the whole United States. And we're proud of that. We're proud that we, we can do so. And it's also uh, uh, an area that the whole community is reaching out and helping. Yes? With, with this new role, will you have more or, or direct dealing with the, the president's administration or the president, or is that more of a staff-to-staff -staff thing? No, it's, it's a mutual uh, area, uh, obviously not on all, all kinds of day-to-day -day issues, but there, there are opportunities to uh, certainly to meet with administration as well as with Congress. I have to pick and choose well, and of course, uh, uh, a staff help on that immensely. But no, that would be part of the role, is having an, an opportunity to uh, uh, build relationships and relationships based on, of course, mutual respect. I mean, I, I'm going to always advocate for the things that I think we know we need. Uh, right now, as you know, uh, the HHS mandates are burdensome. And uh, our Holy Father 
uh, has has said very very recently when we had uh, our meeting with him of how important a robust religious liberty is. You know, I have I have a quote actually that I'll, I'll give you because you I think you'll like this. Uh, I was hoping you'd ask that. Here's what here's what Pope Francis said recently. He said, in the context of society, there is only one thing that the church quite clearly demands, the freedom to proclaim the gospel in its entirety, even when it runs counter to the world, even when it goes against the tide. That's strong language, but it's language that our Holy Father is hoping to give us leadership on. Any, we, we doing all right? Is, this the, is it the final question? Claudia. Uh, a lot of people will want to know, uh, how does this affect Louisville? How does this affect Catholics around Louisville? Well, it's a good question. And, and uh, one of the things you'll want to do is ask some Catholics. But uh, I, I would say this, that my, my gut feeling is that we will benefit. We'll ben certainly, I'm going to benefit because I'm going to be listening and hearing and have access to so many uh, opportunities and ideas. I'm also going to be able to share some of the great things that we do here in the Archdiocese of Louisville. I'm proud to do that. And uh, we have had a very good tradition within the Archdiocese. Claudia, I think I mentioned this to you when we sat down. We've had people in leadership roles within the church, within the United States, for decades. And in all cases, I can't find one example where we did not benefit mightily from their generous service to others. So I see it as being a, 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 let's say, mutual benefit. We will learn from what's happening throughout uh, the rest of the country and maybe throughout the rest of the world. We'll also have a chance to share our most promising practices with others. Yeah. Thank, thanks so much. Thank you very Thank much. You,